During the Second World War, and during that period, time period, most people with a mental illness ended up in a state hospital. It was pretty grim, you know, large numbers of people and very few professional people taking care of them. And uh, it was not always as sensitive to the needs of people as one might expect. And there wasn't a whole lot of treatment other than those who were depressed and got shock treatments. Uh, uh, there was some occupational therapy. Uh, there wasn't much group therapy. Uh, it, it was just existence in the walls of a, a large institution. If you go back when, when people started treating mental illness, uh, 1800s in this state, probably earlier out east, I mean, you had large state institutions. Insurance wasn't even around then. Um, and I guess to the credit of people at that time, at least they took an interest and tried to treat the mentally ill. The stigma goes back to the time when we knew nothing about the brain, nobody knew how to treat it, and what we did, or what people did back then, was just hide people, put them out of, just out of sight. Unfortunately, you know, they were shipped off to some isolated area because that was the thought at the time of a calm, serene, pleasant area was going to have some therapeutic effect. The early leader is people who got a number of community mental health centers going or mental health centers and psychiatric hospitals going in the 50s um, would have been directly influenced by the conscientious objectors that were serving in various state hospitals as an alternative to service during the Second World War. Even after they left their service, they began to carry a feeling that the church community ought to somehow respond to the needs of this group of persons. There was a movement uh, to, to find a better way of doing it, and that better way was offering treatment within the community. Um, and I think that, that was one of the main reasons that Penn Foundation was established, to offer psychiatric services here in this community. By the time insurance came around, 50s, 60s, really in stride by the 70s, 80s, um, a lot of mental health care was still provided through state funds, government funds of one sort or another, county, state, federal, and continued that way. But the history has always been that people with mental illnesses were seen as really not someone that could contribute to society. They were segregated, they were uh, told what to do and where to go, uh, their clothes were taken away from them, they wore patient clothes, so they were really uh, a lot of discrimination and prejudice, and not much opportunity for people with severe mental illnesses. They were viewed as a tremendous burden to families. I remember families that had people in mental hospitals. Uh, I remember a neighbor who, who was there from the time he was a young adult till the time he died. And that was not, not all that unusual. And, uh, you know, uh, at first uh, the families would visit them, but later on, uh, of course, uh, it didn't happen. Well, it's changed a great deal since, since my sister was stricken in 1960. I think she missed a lobotomy by about 15 minutes. I mean, that was for people with uh, then thought of, you know, incurable or totally chronic schizophrenia. Uh, but it, the talk therapy then was, was, by and large, Freudian talk therapy, although Freud had never thought these illnesses were biological, but American psychiatrists kind of took the Freudian thesis and ran with it. Um, it really wasn't until, at that point, I think we were beginning to see some of the early psychotropic medications occur. Um, they were very hard to tolerate. Uh, they would really drop an elephant. And so people who took those found ways to go off of them. They were, they were Civil War medications. Um, and then with, although they were able to, particularly for schizophrenia, they were able to block what we call the positive symptoms of delusions and hallucinations and, you know, and but they thought once those were blocked and people were thus protected from delusional behavior that they could deinstitutionalize them. This has been so paternalistic all the way that, that we were kind of still caring for people. We were not recognizing the strength that they had. 
And it really was the consumer movement itself that, you know, had to live through these medications and live through these kind of hospitalizations and this kind of treatment that 20 years ago said, enough, we are not going to put up with it. They, they, were, they were great leaders. They were, they were scorned and vilified. But they began to send a message, those who were able to get better and regain, you know, all the abilities that they had, that began to form a message of recovery. We didn't hear it really until 2000, maybe 1995. And some real leaders in the fam, you know, in the movement like Bill Anthony, who's a doctor up in Boston, Boston University, who had always talked about rehabilitation as a real possibility for people with mental illness. I was a captain in the Army, a psychologist, and we treated both psychiatric uh, soldiers and neurological soldiers, people with traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, and, and then other folks with psychiatric disorders. And what we found was they were getting very different treatment. The uh, people with the physical disabilities, the neurological disabilities, were getting a lot of rehab and meetings and involvement and so forth. And the soldiers who had come back from Vietnam with a psychiatric disorder uh, were getting medication and maybe a little OT or something like that, but no real heavy involvement and I thought uh, good help. So it was this disparity between what people with physical disability were getting, what people with, at the time, were called mentally ill, not psychiatrically disabled. That disparity uh, caused me to say, we need to do something more with people with uh, mental illness. We need to develop rehab programs for people with mental illness. And that's what we've done. Now, a word now is the recovery model. <clears throat> and that's a good word. It makes me really annoyed when somebody suggests that 25 years ago or 20 years ago, we were not interested in people recovering. Sometimes it almost gets a feeling that we were making invalids out of people, God forbid. <laughs> but, but I think the, <clears throat> the recovery concept is a good one to help people have a sense of hope that even though they've had an illness which has been difficult, that they can continue to live in the community, they continue to live with their families, they can return to work. Well, medications are getting better, and I think the support movement has grown enormously in peer movements. Since 1955 until 2005, there's also been a lot of additional uh, other ways that mental health services have changed. The focus in the early years would have been on perhaps medication and finding medication. The focus in 2005 is on quality of life issues, uh, the recovery model, which is helping individuals to find hope, to believe that they can increase their, their, their uh, I guess, their living condition, that they can find jobs, that they can participate in church activities and in other community activities like anyone else. For someone getting schizophrenia today, the picture will be very different than it is for my sister or my daughter, assuming that they know that they're ill and are willing to look at treatment as a platform for their recovery.